The year was 9 AD, and Rome was at her peak. The Roman commander, Nero Claudius Drusus, had been tasked with handling the German peoples to the north, and as he picked off the disunited tribes one by one, he made the choice to treat them roughly and unjustly. The country was widely devastated, and immense multitudes were carried away from their homes and transplanted to the Gallic bank of the Rhine. Beatings, starvation, children stolen and sold into bondage, and all manner of Roman state-sponsored atrocities were reportedly carried out. Drusus knew that the Germanic warriors could be daunting opponents, but he also knew that they were divided into a great many factions, and that these factions were constantly butting heads with one another, especially with Rome's shrewd hidden hand at play behind the scenes. Fighting a people by all accounts devoid of such shrewdness and cunning themselves, Drusus, sitting at the helm of a military force belonging to the mightiest empire in the world, likely felt all but fearless, and perhaps figured his mistreatment would strike fear in the hearts of this simple people. This would prove to be a costly miscalculation. Resentment had long been building among the German nobles, resentment which had recently come to a fever pitch. Regardless, the Romans had a potent weapon on their side. A German of the Cherusci tribe, named Arminius, who, like so many Germans from noble families, had been taken as a hostage, in the loosest sense of that term, to grow up in Rome, to learn Roman ways and culture and civilization, and learn to respect and love the empire, and take this attitude back to his own people, was employed in the Roman army to help put down revolts and better navigate the terrain. He'd risen to prominence quickly in Rome, and was well liked and respected by all for his merit and the general disposition of his personality. They knew he was a skilled warrior and saw flashes of brilliance as he rose through the ranks, but little did they know what caliber of man their efficient Roman military structure was serving to cultivate here. They would soon find out. In a master stroke of subterfuge, something the Romans wouldn't have expected from the Germans, and perhaps a learned trait that Arminius had picked up in Rome and now saw fit to employ out of necessity, Arminius began to play the long game with Drusus and Varus, and feign alliance and devotion while secretly inventing pretexts to meet with the most powerful German chieftains in the surrounding region. The tribes had been pushed well past their red line, with the brutal, insulting, ignoble treatment they'd endured, and now had decided to go all in relishing the moment they'd be able to teach their Roman foe a lasting lesson. At an agreed-upon time, the ten Roman cohorts spread across the Germanic territory, which Arminius had previously requested as a means of keeping the peace. Each cohort containing approximately 500 Roman soldiers were simultaneously pounced upon and slaughtered to the last man. Arminius then rode to Varus and claimed a revolt in the north required the attention of the Roman force. Having no reason as yet to believe Arminius was anything but a submissive vassal, Varus set off immediately with three legions in tow, exactly as Arminius predicted, taking the precise route he'd expected. The Germans were ready. The Roman soldiers had always been uncomfortable fighting in wholly foreign, often cold or swampy or foggy German forests, but time-tested leadership Tactics, organization, and strength in numbers had always proved enough. Stretched out in a long marching column, it's likely that at this point they still felt confident, if a bit uneasy. But this confidence was about to be shattered, to an extent none of them could have predicted at the time. Without warning and believing themselves to be in safe territory, Germanic warriors streamed out of the forests to simultaneously assail both sides of the all-too-thinly stretched column and massacred many, while throwing the procession into confused chaos. Worse yet, the cavalry auxiliary units protecting Roman flanks as they marched were Germans as well, and very much in on the rebellion. The legions were now spread out, stretched thin, and surrounded. Beating a hasty fighting retreat, the Romans finally set up a fortified camp for the night, and after an attempt to break out of it later in the next day, 
they were set upon again as a torrential rain began to pour. Their wet bows became useless, their shields and weapons waterlogged, and the morale of the men must have begun plummeting to critical levels rarely experienced by a professional Roman army. Picture for a moment the Roman soldier in a hastily constructed night camp, having lost their German guides, entirely surrounded by German forests, filled with German warriors, and as the unrelenting downpour turns the foreign terrain to muck beneath his feet, he realizes just how far he is from home. Fighting men who are for the most part bigger, stronger, and unlike his peers, aren't mercenaries who fight for pay, but rather fight for the love of it. They fight as sport, as a test of courage, as ritual, as release. If they live, they go home a hero. If they die nobly and bravely, they ascend into the afterlife as a hero, making them essentially fearless. Not only are a multitude of various tribes now united as one in opposition, but after years of the grossest disrespect and violence and every form of debasing intrusion, they're now enraged. And led by Arminius, a man who knew Roman armies and tactics like few others, and was both highly motivated and competent. Picture these Romans attempting to sleep at night, as they can't help but hear the infamous German war chants echoing through the darkness of the pitch-black forests in a low, powerful hum. Quote, putting their shields to their mouths, as Tacitus states, so that it may swell to a fuller and deeper sound, end quote. Having watched so many of their legionary peers slaughtered, and likely having glimpsed traces of panic in the face of their leaders, despite best efforts, as they struggled to find a viable path forward, this was the ultimate test of their mettle. In a desperate attempt at escape, the Romans engaged in a night march, in exactly the territory Arminius had expected, no doubt wondering with each successive step if it might be their last. Suddenly, showing a strategic mastery of tactics once again, a mass of Germans appeared as if from nowhere. The second in command of Varus threw off the famed Roman discipline and flat out turned tail to escape with his entire cavalry attachment. An attempt that would prove in vain, as he was soon overtaken by German cavalry, who then acted as the karmic force set to punish their cowardice by slaughtering them to the last man. As Varus tried desperately to keep some semblance of order, the Germans finally swarmed onto the frightened chaos of men this time in mass. It was a slaughter, and amidst it all, Varus took his own life. Everything had gone precisely according to plan for Arminius. The defeat was so total, with estimates of 20,000 men dead, three entire legions, that the Emperor Augustus was said to have walked around in a daze for several weeks afterwards back in Rome, pounding his head and his fists against the floors and the walls of his palace shouting, Quintilius Verus, give me back my legions. The Germans, their fury apparent, showed absolutely no mercy in this instance, and reports were that upon returning to the area six years later, Roman legions found grisly trophies of the defeat everywhere, purposefully left for Roman eyes, perhaps as a lesson, a reminder, including men nailed to trees, and the remnants of many others burned in the sacred groves. Never again would Rome attempt to conquer all of the German lands. So who were these men? It's important to note, first and foremost, that if it weren't for Roman sources, we'd have known absolutely nothing of Arminius and his actions. The Germanic peoples, very broadly speaking, disprized writing, and instead preferred bards and the human voice in recounting their great tales. How many other heroes and exceptional stories of great courage, competence, daring, have thus gone unsung in our age? We may never know the answer to this, but the following will be a clumsy attempt to bring together some of what we do know. Discussing the Goths and Germanic peoples is a daunting task, not only because it's a subject of such immense historical importance, but because there are few historical topics so rife with misinformation, misdirection, confusion, and muddied waters. 
I believe one of the main reasons for this is due to the post-World War II paralysis, as an entire people were pushed into a state of self-flagellation and the most extreme sort of shame and self-hatred. From the conclusion of this war forward, not only Germany, but across the Western world, our conception of history changed its face almost entirely, simultaneous with the changing face of academia. Any data that painted Germanic or Indo-Aryan peoples in too positive a light was viewed with extreme skepticism, and almost always dismissed out of hand, or buried or ignored whereas historical accounts that fit the reverse narrative were actively sought out, embraced, championed. And this happens naturally and unconsciously in an environment in which the cultural pendulum has swung so far in one direction. The expression of the victors writing the history books is more deeply true than most could even fathom. And though we sometimes think of this type of bias as a determinant of which individual facts might be included or tossed out, it goes far deeper than this. The underlying premise we set out with, the fundamental narratives and storylines, the frame of reference, determines how we create our fact picture of history. It acts as the root from which all branches spring. When the root is infected by serious bias, everything which springs from it will inevitably be a result of this built-in bias. In such a natural and organic fashion that it often goes unrecognized for what it is. When we approach history dishonestly, when we paint an inaccurate picture for future generations, we're committing one of the greatest sins it's possible to commit. It's a profound disservice to the dead, especially those who lived lives of self-sacrifice in service to something higher than themselves. But it's an equally powerful disservice to those young minds being molded and shaped who need truth and an accurate picture of reality in order to learn the lessons from the past that better help them develop in a healthy manner. I've long considered this to be one of the greatest tragedies of our age, and it's one of the many reasons I launched this series. I won't go too far down these paths for the moment, as I value my YouTube channel and reach, and fully recognize this isn't a platform on which one can expect to be honest on such topics and hope to go unpunished. But I do hope to bring to light the story of the ancient Gothic and Germanic peoples in what I believe is a more objective manner than most. As with the other videos, this is so far from comprehensive that a more honest title might have been The Tip of the Iceberg, a prelude to an introduction to a prelude of an introduction to the Germanic peoples. But also, as with the other videos, I expect these two videos will just be the first on the topic, with more to follow. So, here we go. Origins is a tricky word, and of course it's rarely used with technical accuracy with regards to human history. Definitively tracing the origins of a people to a specific area is virtually impossible. Short of hard and fast knowledge that they sprung from the soil, or were created by a higher power on a certain patch of ground at a given time, the word is largely a misnomer. And what we usually mean by it is that a people were highly concentrated in a given area at a given time, before spreading outwards. Tracing the origins of the Germanic peoples is especially difficult, perhaps more so than any other group. And the reason for this difficulty is a key point of this video. One of the biggest misconceptions is that these were largely settled tribes, who rarely moved or migrated, but rather milled around in European forests for millennia. The ancestors of Goethe, Beethoven, Heisenberg, and von Braun were supposedly exclusively contained on this small patch of land, contributing little to nothing to the larger storyline of empires, cultures, and peoples. I was taught this growing up, and in part due to the gravitas of modern academic consensus, I believed it myself to some degree for much of my life until I became completely engrossed in the subject of history and began to seek out the oldest, first-hand historical accounts and the broader picture, at which point my perspective changed entirely. One of these accounts was written by a man of Gothic lineage himself around 500 AD, a summarization of a still more ancient source written by Cassiodorus, which unfortunately has been lost to us. This man was called Jordanus, 
and I highly recommend reading his story in full. I may even narrate it at some point if the interest is there, and I've linked it below in the video description. His account, which seems to agree with the others of his era and beyond, speaks to a people that were anything but domesticated and locked in place. Very much the opposite. And after all of my research, I can't help but believe the long migration of the Goths that he highlights was hardly unique in the history of the Indo-Aryan peoples, but rather a hallmark and defining element of their character. This urge to strike out, to explore, especially when success in any given region caused a population density that restricted their desire for individual plots of land to call their own. And another prominent reason for movements and migrations, one made especially difficult to discuss in today's atmosphere, seems to be something almost akin to what we today call white flight, a fleeing from environments that no longer felt comfortable, safe, or healthy for any reason, or that prevented them in any way from living the types of lives they sought to lead, or more importantly, restricted their freedoms in any way. The history of the Germanic peoples seems to be one of Volkswanderung, and the debate still rages as to what region they inhabited in ancient times, prior to major splits and migrations. With some certain it was in or near Scandinavia, others just as certain it started near the Caucasus, or Iran, or India, or even the Middle East. This is a profoundly intriguing topic, and one I'll be devoting future videos to. But in an effort to prevent this video from being excessively long, I believe the best summary to be this. I think most of the confusion here is precisely due to that characteristic of the Aryans previously mentioned, namely that this larger genetic and cultural family spread exceedingly far and wide over the period from approximately 3 to 4000 BC to 3 or 400 AD. Keep in mind that individuals of fair eyes and hair and skin, tall in stature, of the I and R1A and R1B haplogroups have been found in large numbers as far afield as China, India, Iran, all throughout the Black Sea region, extending into North Africa, even the Americas, and of course, Europe, and virtually everywhere in between. For example, ancient DNA testing has confirmed the presence of haplogroup marker R1A M417 in samples from the Corded Ware culture in Germany, dating to 2600 BC, from Tocharian mummies dating to about 2000 BC in northwest China, from Kurgan burials, circa 1600 BC, from the Andronovo culture in southern Russia and southern Siberia, as well as from a variety of other Iron Age sites from Russia, Siberia, Mongolia, and Central Asia. And these weren't simply individual travelers, these were groups and settlements. Aside from the royal element, those rulers and leaders and chieftains who so often kept detailed records of genealogy for dynastic purposes, the broader populations could easily lose track of their relation to one another over time. This process is best thought of in the manner of a family tree visual, with a single root branching out into exponential complexity. And even though the branches might remain relatively free of racial and cultural admixture from the outside, they would, over time, develop their own unique manifestation of that larger culture with their own heroes and tales and other unifying and distinctive elements. There's a real beauty in this. These manifestations of independent storylines, all dancing around and reflecting the same core elements, each in their own unique way. But it also, of course, makes the history a bit trickier to properly sort and sift. So to simplify, we're going to pick up their tale around the point which Jordanus himself first speaks of a definitive large migration, a movement which may have been a retracing of a previous migration path, as the Danube and Rhine might well be thought of as something of a frequently traveled highway between northern Europe and the Black Sea region. Agreeing with Cassiodorus, the history from whom most of his work is derived, he dates this movement of his Gothic ancestors to approximately 1500 BC, arriving into the land of Scythia indicating just how easily Germanic peoples would expand and fragment into tribes, each with their own name and personal identity, he mentions one group, delayed to their slower ships, being called the Gepidae, a light-hearted Gothic insult of sorts meaning slow or stolid. 
and mentions later a large separation of the two major groups due to a bridge failing before the entire migration party had crossed. Intriguingly, he pins these mysterious words with regards to yet another separation of peoples in this long migration. Quote, Philomer, king of the Goths, found among his people certain witches, whom he called in his native tongue Halierne. Suspecting these women, he expelled them from the midst of his race and compelled them to wander in solitary exile afar from his army. There, the unclean spirits who beheld them as they wandered through the wilderness bestowed their embraces upon them and begat this savage race, which dwelt at first in the swamps, a stunted, foul, and puny tribe, scarcely human and having no language, save one which bore but slight resemblance to human speech. Such was the descent of the Huns who came to the country of the Goths." End quote. This expulsion, if true, was to set the stage for later events that would completely change the scope of world history. Jordanus mentions the Goths eventually settling in the region around the Black Sea, which we spoke of in the part two of this series as the central hub of the Scythian peoples. And this shouldn't be surprising. The blanket racial designation of Scythian was virtually synonymous with the Gothic people for many ancient historians. And one might include Thracian, even Dacian, and the later term Germanic among these blanket terms so often used by older sources to refer to a larger racial and cultural family of peoples. I very much agree with the Anglo-Saxon historian Sharon Turner when he says, quote, The Anglo-Saxons, Lowland Scotch, Normans, Danes, Norwegians, Swedes, Germans, Dutch, Belgians, Lombards, and Franks have all sprung from that great fountain of the human race, which we have distinguished by the term Scythian, German or Gothic." End quote. And I believe this broader perspective provides a much more clear and helpful understanding of history. Jordana speaks of his people's ancient battle with the Egyptians, recounting the legendary Scythian Gothic king Tanausis and his routing of Sesostris in approximately 1300 BC, chasing him all the way back to Egypt, and on the return journey subjugating much of Asia, making the lands subject to Sornus, king of the Medes, who was, quote, his dear friend, another illustration of the close connection and kinship between peoples presented in most modern historical accounts as wholly disconnected and unrelated to one another. It's interesting to note here that more than one source speaks of how a band of Trojans, 12,000 strong in most accounts, led by Priam and Antenor, sailed from Troy to the river Don in Russia and on to Pannonia on the river Danube, settling near the Sea of Azov, which, of course, is where we find our Goths and Scythians later mentioned, founding a city called Sicambria. Jordana speaks of one king of the Getai, a Gothic people, as being Telephus, a son of Hercules, and the husband of the sister of Priam, of Trojan fame. Telephus, quote, was of towering stature and terrible strength. He matched his father's valor by virtues of his own, and also recalled the traits of Hercules by his likeness in appearance. Our ancestors called his kingdom Moesia. This province has, on the east, the mouths of the Danube, on the south, Macedonia, on the west, Histria, and on the north, the Danube." End quote. Jordanus goes on to recount the personal battles of Telephus with Ajax, Ulysses, and Achilles, and eventually being mortally wounded in the fight. He also mentions Cyrus attacking the Getai, whose queen was Tamyris, the same Tamyris mentioned as queen of the Scythians in part two of our series, who went on to rout Cyrus and his Persians to avenge the death of her son. Darius, too, was to try his luck against the Scythian and Gothic people, only to meet the same fate, despite an army reputed to contain 700,000 men, likely due to those highly mobile guerrilla warfare and scorched earth tactics highlighted in the Scythian video. Following Darius's failure, quote, after his death, his son Xerxes planned to avenge his father's wrongs and so proceeded to undertake a war against the Goths with 700,000 of his own men and 300,000 armed auxiliaries, 1,200 ships of war, and 3,000 transports, but he did not venture to try them in battle, being overawed by their unyielding courage. 
So he returned with his force, just as he had come, and without fighting a single battle." End quote. And this illustrates an important and unique element of this people and their history. Almost universally, across any historical account you're likely to find, they were spoken of with respect, even by their enemies. As Edred Thorson states in his Mysteries of the Goths, quote, This prestige certainly had a metaphysical dimension as well. Gothic identity was not merely a random or arbitrary thing. It implied a degree of greatness, and bore a whole series of ideological traits as well. Freedom, independence, heroism, individualism within group solidarity, end quote. This was a people that cared deeply about upholding the honor of their name, seemingly both as tribute to their ancestors and a gift to their descendants, and would sooner die than be seen as cowardly, scheming, weak, ignoble, or otherwise unjust. This innate characteristic would follow them, and Tacitus speaks of their own internal governing and decision-making being dictated in a similar manner stating the very prestige of a chief may settle a war, and mentioning how leadership was by example, not authority, gravitas and prestige and respect, as opposed to an arbitrary, superimposed social or political structure. I believe this allowed for the formation of a much more natural and healthy hierarchy, one which was capable of adjusting in real time, and required leaders to conduct themselves in a manner befitting their position, on this note, it's stunning to see how closely the accounts of Herodotus and Pompeius Tragus and others of the ancient Scythians mirror those of Tacitus's later accounts of the Germans. Another testament to this prestige is the story of Philip, father of Alexander the Great, who had made alliance with the Goths by taking to wife a daughter of a Gothic king. However, needing money made the mistake of attacking Odessus, a city of Moesia, which was subject to the Goths. It's said that at the approach of the Macedonians, quote, those priests of the Goths that are called the holy men suddenly opened the gates of Odessus and came forth to meet them. They bore harps and were clad in snowy robes and chanted in suppliant strains to the gods of their fathers that they might be propitious and repel the Macedonians. When the Macedonians saw them coming with such confidence to meet them, they were astonished and, so to speak, the armed were terrified by the unarmed. Straight away, they broke the line they had formed for battle, and not only refrained from destroying the city, even gave back those whom they had captured outside by right of war. Then they made a truce and returned to their own country." End quote. Such accounts seem almost unbelievable until viewed in totality with the rest of the accounts of the reputation that followed these people, whom I believe may be those mysterious royal Scythians Herodotus and others mention as the foremost among the related scattered tribes. On this note, before we follow the trail back into Europe, I'd be remiss not to mention a theory posited by Thor Heyerdahl and others, which suggests that the fame Asir, the deified tribe of gods or leaders at the heart of Norse and Germanic ancestor worship, as well as Odin himself, were very real people. The term is etymologically connected to ansis, meaning half-gods, which further stretches back to a Proto-Indo-European word, essentially meaning life force, and Avestan and Sanskrit terms meaning lord and godhood. It's widely believed this word stems from a still more ancient term meaning to create, produce. He makes the argument for an etymological connection of Asir to the Aziri of Azerbaijan which Heyerdahl and others posit as being their ancient pre-migration homeland. The word Azir in Persian means fire, and in Turkic means high. The Icelandic sagas speak in a matter-of-fact manner about the Asir people, and their principal settlement being in a city wedged along the Caucasus Mountains. European royalty routinely traced their lineage back through Troy, the Scythians, and even Odin himself, until fairly recent times in which these figures began to be framed as fictitious gods. And to their credit, these genealogies seem to make sense in the broader scope of written accounts. Thor Heyerdahl had been working on a deeply intriguing book he called The Hunt for Odin, which no doubt would have provided a great deal more helpful context here, but sadly died before its completion. 
He not only claimed Odin was a flesh and blood figure, but also broke from others in that he didn't place him in the most remote antiquity, but rather as a respected chieftain who helped lead one of the mass migrations back to the west. To quote Snorri Sturluson, author of the Norse Eddas, At that time when Odin lived, the Romans were conquering far and wide in the region. When Odin learned that they were coming towards the land of the Aesirs, he decided that it was best for him to take his priests, chiefs, and some of his people and move to the northern part of Europe." End quote. On the website osterholm.net, which I've linked below and seems to contain a trove of useful information, albeit much of it not yet embraced by academia, mentions that the most prominent clan to travel with the Aesir were the Errol Warriors, or the Errolar, meaning wild warriors. The Aesir sent the Errolar, or Irolar, north as seafaring warriors to secure land and establish trade. These warriors were called the Earls and Jarls in later Scandinavian society, and known as the Heruls and Heruli by the Romans. The clans enabled the Asir clans, later called the Svi, Sviar, Svie, Svir, or Svioner by the Romans, to establish settlements throughout the region, but not without continuous battles with the Goths and other migrating Germanic tribes. The Eruls or Heruls eventually made peace with the Goths who ruled the region. The tribes of the Svir, Vanir, and Heruli soon formed their own clans and dominated the Baltic and Scandinavian region. The Gothic historian Jordanus, who was a notary of the Gothic kings, told about 551 AD that the Danir were from the same stock as the Svir, both taller and fairer than any other people in the north. The Svir population flourished, and with the Heruls and Goths formed a powerful military alliance of well-known seafarers. The Svir and Heruls then gradually returned to their ancestral land, beginning in the 2nd century AD. Sometimes sailing with the Goths, they terrorized all the lands and peoples of the Black Sea and parts of the Mediterranean, even the Romans. They were the pre-Vikings." And indeed, we find several mentions of the Heruls in the works of Tacitus, Jordanus, and others, spoken of as especially famed and respected warriors. These topics are still hotly debated, as they should be, and some of this is subjective speculation, albeit educated speculation. But my advice would be to beware those who dismiss such accounts out of hand without hard evidence. The modern approach seems to be to start with the premise that nearly all historical accounts are false or flawed, whereas I tend to think that most of the histories were penned with genuine intent, i.e. for the purpose of retaining an account of actual happenings. And I believe there should be a burden of proof, but there should also be a burden to disprove, if this makes sense especially in the cases in which we only have a single document or two to make use of, and when the information contained within fits cleanly into and fills in the blanks of a larger fact picture. The word debunk in our age seems to have somehow become all-powerful, and skeptics have a way of destroying and dragging through the mud any theory that strays from their chosen storyline. This strikes me as dangerous. So, as we slowly move west into Europe, pushed at times by Rome, at times by population growth, at times by incursions of both foreign and brother peoples from the east in a domino effect, the Scythians, using the broadest definition here, seem to almost seamlessly morph into the Goths, again using the broader definition. Interestingly, Strabo and Pliny the Elder separated the Scythians into two elements the Sarmatae and the Germani, the latter term derived from the Latin Germanus, meaning genuine, of the same parents. Recall in part two where we spoke of the royal Scythians often being referred to as the genuine Scythians. It may be that the Sarmatae were a Scythian element with some foreign admixture, whether racial or cultural or both. Interestingly, the Anglo-Saxons were also known as the Germani. Strabo further refers to a people known as the Celto-Scythi, or the Celtic Scythians. As one writer puts it, if we go back 500 years from the point of when the Teutonic languages began to differentiate, we discover that great swaths of Northern, Western, and Eastern Europeans spoke similar dialects of a common Indo-European language. 
When scholars try to pin a label on a particular European barbarian tribe, as being Germanic or Celtic or Scythian, they often find themselves in a quandary. Distinctions are often unclear and can easily become arbitrary." End quote. It's vital to keep in mind that prior to the bulk of the Goths arriving back into Europe, their German brothers were already present on the land. With the Cimbrian War kicking off the conflict between Roman and Germanic peoples in earnest in approximately 110 BC, and others, too, giving Julius Caesar a taste of what was to come, as he mentions firsthand in his work, The Commentaries on the Gallic War. Almost from the start, there was a relationship of mutual respect, at least with regards to martial capabilities. And the Romans, too, held to one of the longest traditions across all Indo-European societies in employing almost exclusively Scythian and Germanic peoples in the personal bodyguard of the leadership in this case, the Roman Emperor, a hand-picked elite cadre of men chosen for both fighting merit and an unshakable sense of loyalty and honor. The Praetorian or Varangian or Swiss Guard units are just a few examples of this long-standing custom, a custom which I personally believe originated with the royal Scythians as a means to protect royal lineages. Tacitus gives us the best account of the ancient Germans in their natural state, and I highly recommend his works especially Germania, for those seeking additional context. He's not merely a brilliant man, but seems to possess an especially healthy and well-oriented mind, coupled with judgment and foresight to see many things that those around him seem to miss. I've linked his audiobook below for those interested, but to cover a few interesting excerpts, he speaks of the German name being a fairly recent invention and a misnomer a Roman interpretation of the name of a single tribe, which they then lazily applied to all of the scattered tribes. He speaks of ancient songs and bards being the mechanism for passing down history and stories, and mirroring the Scythian legends, quote, They say that Hercules too once visited them, and when going into battle they sing of him first of all heroes, and speaks of the infamous war chants they employed. Ulysses, too, was spoken of as having visited, and founded an ancient town. And Tacitus speaks of a shrine of him containing Greek inscriptions still existing on the borders of Germany. Their kings were chosen by birth, their generals by merit. Neither had unlimited power, and they led by personal example. Quote, the very prestige of a chief may settle a war, end quote. And it was considered a disgrace for a chief to be surpassed in valor and infamy to have survived a battle in which one's chief had died, which I believe hints at one of the many reasons why the Germans were so highly sought in the Praetorian and Beringian and all similar royal bodyguard units. Their squadrons of fighting men weren't formed by chance, he says, no doubt contrasting Rome's mercenary structure, but composed of families and clans, meaning they'd always fight alongside brothers and kin and be encouraged to have their wounds tended to by women who were wives or relatives, who, quote, Tradition says that armies already wavering and giving way have been rallied by women who, with earnest entreaties and bosoms laid bare, have vividly represented the horrors of captivity, which the Germans fear with such extreme dread on behalf of their women. And, quote, they even believe that the sex has a certain sanctity and prescience, and they do not despise their counsels or make light of their answers." End quote. Like so many other Indo-European peoples, they seem to place the highest value on maidens of noble birth. After all, a man is technically capable of passing his genetic lineage down to hundreds, even thousands of descendants, in the manner of a Genghis Khan, or perhaps even Heracles. So it's the woman who is the key component in this regard. He speaks of the style of dress as cloaks fastened with a clasp, or with skin-fitting clothing made from wild beasts, and speaks of the inner tribes as dressing better. Their diet was largely composed of wild fruit and fresh game and curdled milk. Similar to all other writers, he speaks very highly of their sense of, and customs with regards to, justice. Crimes were to be exposed and punished. Infamy was to be buried out of sight. Good habits, he says, 
were more effectual than good laws elsewhere. He speaks of them as a race with no natural cunning, and regarding their trade and barter, the vitally important line of interest they know nothing, and says no nation is more hospitable, and it was their custom to give and receive freely, feeling no obligation from either action. Like the Spartans and Scythians and so many other related peoples, each individual in a rite of passage must earn their arms, and abandoning one's shield was considered the basest action, resulting in shunning. They considered it, quote, tame and stupid to acquire by immense toil what they might win by courage, valor, or blood, and didn't well tolerate close quarters with regards to living spaces, but spread out freely to whatever areas attracted them. They often indulged in what he calls games of hazard, sparring and warlike contests, sometimes wagering their own freedom, and in exceptional cases, even their lives in the competitions. And with regards to slavery, the type practiced by those Tacitus observed was very different from that we are accustomed to. Each, quote, slave was given a house of their own and acted as indentured servants, required to give a certain amount of produce periodically. Each tribe seems to have created its own niche culture within the larger framework. One of the more intriguing descriptions of a wilder tribe on the borderlands is as follows, quote, the Hari, besides being superior in strength to the tribes just enumerated, savage as they are, make the most of their natural ferocity by the help of art and opportunity. Their shields are black, their bodies dyed. They choose dark nights for battle, and, by the dread and gloomy aspect of their death-like host, strike terror into the foe, who can never confront their strange and almost infernal appearance. For in all battles it is the eye which is first vanquished." End quote. In another description, he speaks of the Cimbri, likely descendants of the Cimmerians, quote, In the same remote corner of Germany, bordering on the ocean, dwell the Cimbri, a now insignificant tribe, but of great renown. Of their ancient glory, widespread traces yet remain. On both sides of the Rhine are encampments of vast extent, and by their circuit you may even now measure the warlike strength of the tribe, and find evidence of that mighty immigration. Rome was in her 640th year when we first heard of the Cimbrian invader in the consulship of Caelius Metellus and, and Papirius Carbo, from which time to the second consulship of the Emperor Trajan we have to reckon about 210 years. So long have we been in conquering Germany. In the space of this long epoch, many losses have been sustained on both sides. Neither Samnite, nor Carthaginian, nor Spain, nor Gaul, not even the Parthians have given us more frequent warnings. German independence truly is fiercer than the despotism of an Osasis. Germans, by routing or making prisoners of Carbo, Cassius, Scarus Aurelius, Servilius Capio, Marcus Manlius, deprived the Roman people of five consular armies, and they robbed even a Caesar of Varus and his three legions. They stormed the winter camp of our legions and even designed the conquest of Gaul. May the tribes, I pray, ever retain, if not the love for us, at least the hatred for each other." End quote. One of the many reasons Tacitus has not been given due credit in our times is due to a single statement that to this day drives the politically correct mindset into a frenzy. Quote, For my own part, I agree with those who think that the tribes of Germany are free from all taint of intermarriages with foreign nations, and they appear as a distinct, unmixed race like none but themselves. Hence, too, the same physical peculiarities through so vast a population." End quote. Now, keep in mind he's referencing a large group of people here, not a nation, as Germany itself didn't exist as a nation until very recently. Also keep in mind, as you witness modern academics trip over themselves to dismiss these words in any and every novel manner they can dream up, here was one of the best minds of his age, sober and prudent, who had perhaps more experience with the varied races of humanity and every possible mixture among them due to his observing both Germania and the increasingly multicultural empire of Rome than any of his peers, stating this opinion with definitive confidence. So, let's take a moment to speak to the Goths, specifically, 
as defined by those who saw them in their most narrow and specific form. First, the name. The Grimm brothers, noted as great historical minds in addition to being masterful authors, believe the term goth to be closely connected to the German Gott, meaning God. Others have suggested the term meant nobly born, and there's an obvious connection to the root gut, meaning good. I tend to think that there's likely a grain of truth to most of these connections, directly or indirectly. Second, as to the physical description, the historian Henry Bradley sums up the almost universal description with, quote, Goths are always described as tall and athletic men with fair complexions, blue eyes and yellow hair. Such people as in fact might be seen more frequently in Sweden than in any other land, end quote. And the Arab diplomat Ibn Fadlan would later describe the Viking Rus, likely the most direct outgrowth of the Gothic peoples as they came to be known under different names, by saying, quote, Never before have I seen people of more perfect physique. They were tall like palm trees, blonde, with a few of them red. They do not wear any jackets or caftanier, robes. The men instead wear a dress which covers one side of the body, but leaves one hand free. Every one of them brings with him an axe, a sword, and a knife." End quote. Third, as to their general personality and manner of being, the historian Bradley continues, quote, that the Gothic people had many noble qualities was frequently acknowledged, even by their enemies, and it is abundantly proved by many incidents in their history. They were brave, generous, patient under hardship and privation, and chaste and affectionate in their family relations." End quote. And then continues with an interesting aside that despite their history of achievement and successes, I too have come to agree with, quote, there is nothing in their history more remarkable than the humanity and justice which they exercised towards the nations whom they conquered." End quote. He goes on to state that this was recognized by their foes, who often went so far as to welcome their appearance on the scene as liberators. In a remarkably objective quip, a Roman named Salvian, an ecclesiastic of Marseille, stated, "...there is one consenting prayer among the Roman population, that they might dwell under their barbarian government." Thus our brethren not only refuse to leave these nations for their own, but they fly from us to them. Can we then wonder that the Goths are not conquered by us, when the people would rather become Goths with them than Romans with us?" End quote. Fourth, with regards to their belief structure, I've always loved this snippet by Tacitus, which I believe to be fundamental in importance. Quote, the Germans, however, do not consider it consistent for the grandeur of celestial beings to confine the gods within walls, or to liken them to the form of any human countenance. They consecrate woods and groves, and they apply the names of deities to the abstraction which they see only in spiritual worship. End quote. To me, this meaning is clear. The capital G God creator of all things was something beyond direct human understanding or quantification, and certainly beyond the ability for fallible human minds or hands to create in the form of idols to then be worshipped. Nature, in the form of sacred groves, was the closest proxy. They certainly practiced a veneration of ancestors, bordering on a form of worship, and held in extremely high esteem both Hercules and the archetype of Tiwaz or Tyre, also known as Ares to the Greeks, Mars to the Romans, who they saw as the personification of war, law, and justice simultaneously. Odin as well, and Freya. There's a great deal more to be said on the subject, but I couldn't hope to do it justice here, so I'll leave it at this for now, after a few more words about the concept of ancestor veneration. Edred Thorson states that the Gothic families maintained secret traditions stretching back to the time of their origins. Quote, it is these sources which account for their success and the immortality of their name. These traditions hinged on the continuing secret cult of divine ancestry, the hidden cult of the Ancies. The formula of divine ancestry must be understood in both its parts. First, the idea is that there is a divine, immortal, perfect, and wise component, or element, or substance, which is not bound by time or place. This transcends the mundane world, stands above it. Second is the idea that this substance can be transmitted or transferred from person to person, 
or from generation to generation, through historical time and over natural space. We know that this ancestral portion could be transmitted genetically through the blood, or through symbolic initiations, blood brotherhood, adoption, reception into warrior bands, guilds, etc. Although these latter methods were well known to the pagans and well documented among them, it appears that under the influence of the Christian tradition of apostolic succession, these later methods grew to be more and more prestigious over the centuries. This increasingly became the method whereby the threatened esoteric of the Goths could be secretly transmitted and thus protected from an ever more hostile world." End quote. And with regards to Christianity, the evidence seems to contradict the popular notion many still hold that all Germanic peoples were dragged kicking and screaming into a new religious conception, or forced at the point of a sword. In fact, the very first book written in the Gothic language was a translation of the Bible, penned by a man the emperor dubbed our second Moses, a Gothic Cappadocian named Vulfilla, literally transcribed as Little Wolf in the 3rd century AD. Now, of course, this wasn't modern Christianity, much of which seems to have been subverted into something of an extension of the very worldly social justice movement, but rather a much more strict and true-to-form conception. The bigger leap didn't seem to be to Christianity, whose central focus on a self-sacrificing figure bore some resemblance to Odin, who was hung on a tree and in some stories pierced by a spear. The more difficult leap was rather to Catholicism, as opposed to that Aryan form of Christianity, which was more familiar and comfortable to them, and that didn't require they bend the knee to priests and churches of Rome. The Franks, the Germanic people largely responsible for the creation of France as we know it today, acting as Rome's first and strongest allies willing to adopt Catholicism, were in some sense tasked with its spread across all German lands, a difficult and bloody transition in part planting the seeds of the Protestant and Catholic conflicts of later eras. It's also deeply interesting that the Goths and Norse were referred to as the Maju during the Visigothic period in Spain, with the non-Gothic elements making no distinction between them and the Magi of Zoroastrian Persian fame, a term you might recognize in part from the three wise men of the biblical tradition. Rome, especially the Eastern Roman Empire under Justinian, would begin to exploit this Catholic and Arian rift as a means of establishing greater control over the Goths, or attempting to destroy those he couldn't control. A hallmark trait of the Germanic people seems to be an unwillingness to bow to any form of centralized authority that doesn't spring from their own roots. A lesson foreign rulers would need to learn and relearn several times throughout history often at the point of an extremely proficient sword. We'll discuss this and get to know the Gothic people through an examination of their dynamic with Rome, the Huns, the Jews, and the Saracens in the next installment in our series, which I hope to release within a week or two from now, and which may be followed by a third video shortly after, as it's simply impossible to condense this story into a single hour. We'll also be introduced to some of the most exceptional and impressive figures in human history, figures modern history books seem to give scant reference to, if any, yet who by any objective standard towered over their peers, and encapsulate the essence of the Gothic spirit, and who would proceed to lay the groundwork for Gothic dominance of the Roman Empire, all of Europe, stretching east to the Black Sea, even North Africa, and then planting the seed that would one day grow into modern Russia. So. Until then.